Center for Functional Medicine at Cleveland Clinic. We're thrilled you're all here, and uh, even more thrilled to have an extraordinary speaker for our grand rounds today, Dr. Darish Mazafarian. He's the uh, Jean Mayer Professor of Tufts, Friedman School uh, of Nutrition, Science, and Policy. He's the dean, uh, and he is an extraordinary physician who's published more than 400 scientific papers on, on diet and obesity, diabetes, heart disease, he works uh, very intensively with nutrition policy and government. We've collaborated on a number of things. Uh, he's a graduate of Stanford, Columbia, WashU, and many other incredible organizations. Uh, was really worked at Harvard for a long time, and has got a, um, a doctorate degree in public health from Harvard. And it's just uh, been such an impactful force in the field of nutrition and nutrition science. Uh, and we're really thrilled to have him talking about food as medicine. And most importantly, uh, he's a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. So you don't want to mess with him and what he says. So <laughs> welcome, Dari. We're so thrilled to have you and excited to hear about your talk about food as medicine, which I think is in a very important conversation today as we face an incredible barrage of chronic disease, mostly driven by food. So welcome and take it away. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mark, and thank you uh, to the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine for, for having this talk. Um, uh, I, I work with uh, Stan Hazen at, at Cleveland Clinic, and and you know, wonderful, wonderful center uh, overall with so much, so much strength in in, in clinical medicine and research. So, uh, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, I think what's going on around food as medicine, and I'm going to, for the purposes of this talk, find food as medicine as the concept of integrating food, healthy eating, and nutrition uh, into the healthcare system. And uh, in terms of my disclosures, all of my research funding is from, you know, government sources or, or nonprofit organizations. I have received honoraria for, for giving talks like this, uh, and um, I sit on uh, several scientific advisors. The learning objectives are to, you know, really discuss the new science and updated dietary priorities around treating major chronic diseases, to discuss the types and strength of evidence behind food as medicine approaches, and explore emerging policy priorities and next directions. And so, that's, you know, uh, as a cardiologist, uh, why am I interested in food and nutrition? And, you know, my response, only partially joking, is why isn't every cardiologist focused on, on food and nutrition? Uh, you know, this slide kind of summarizes why I, I do what I do. It, it, the, the food and nutrition impacts almost every major aspect of our lives. It's the single leading cause of poor health globally. Uh, it's also a major contributor to uh, hunger uh, and, and disparities. Um, it, and, and those two things, in particular diet-related chronic diseases, are driving tremendous rises in healthcare costs, which is suffocating uh, government budgets and suffocating private business and economic growth. Uh, our food system is also the single biggest for uh, sustainability on our planet. 70% um, of the world's water use, 90% of tropical deforestation, 25% of climate change emissions, stress to our topsoil, uh, stress to the oceans. Uh, this is, if you put it all together, again, the single biggest issue for sustainability on the planet. And then as if health, equity, uh, the economy, and, and sustainability wasn't enough, this is also a major issue for national security. And we forget about this. We forgot in the last few decades, but I think this is very important because if we're going to create coalitions to help fix food, we have to bring in the national security issues. Um, over 70% of young Americans don't qualify for the military, and the number one medical reason is overweight and obesity. And so uh, Mission Readiness, a group of over 750 uh, retired admirals and generals, has put out several reports about this major national security threat, uh, including one recent report called uh, unfit and unprepared. Now, uh, you know, this is just one example of uh, di dietary risks for for uh, poor health in our country. This graph shows causes of death in, in any given year. Um, uh, there are several hundred thousand deaths uh, per, uh, per year just related to directly attributable to poor diet. And so what this graph shows is the causes of death here in, in hundreds of thousands and the, and the modifiable uh, risk factors, and again, diet exceeds tobacco smoking as the number one cause of poor health. So, if you're in a healthcare system, if you're a healthcare provider, if you're in public health, if you care about healthcare costs, you have to be talking about diet. And when, and when I think about, you know, any of the campaigns that I've seen, whether it's for, uh, um, you know, the recent presidential election or any prior president president election, 
I've never heard any of the candidates make this direct and obvious connection that if we're going to fix health and healthcare, we have to fix food. And, and this is because we are so sick and it's, it's, it's almost impossible to believe how sick we've become over the last 50 years. Many more Americans are sick than are actually healthy. And so being healthy is now the rare exception in our country. Half of all adults in our country have diabetes or prediabetes. That is just shock, shocking statistics. More than half have some form of cardiovascular disease. Three and four are overweight or obese. And if you put together kind of traditional metabolic risk factors, only 12% of American adults have normal levels of metabolic risk factors. So 88% of us are metabolically unhealthy. And the economic costs uh, of this are, are incredible. Over uh, since 1970, Healthcare costs have skyrocketed from 5% to almost one third of the total federal budget and from 5% to almost 29% of, of total state budget. And so a lot of the partisanship, a lot of the, our inability to invest in infrastructure and to do many of the other things, invest in education, uh, invest in, in you know, rural revitalization comes because we are drowning in, in healthcare expenses. Um, for businesses, this is a major problem. This isn't just a government problem. If you adjust for inflation, over 50 years, U.S. businesses, again, adjusted for inflation, constant dollars, their healthcare spending has gone from about $80 billion uh, per year in the United States to $1.2 trillion. And if you put it all together, we're spending over $11,000 per man, woman, and child each year in the United States on healthcare. So think about that. An average family of four, $44,000 per year spent on healthcare. That greatly exceeds housing budgets greatly exceeds food budgets. It, it, indeed, it greatly exceeds the entire family income for many families in the United States. It's completely unsustainable. And a lot of this is related to diet-related chronic diseases. Now, this is just a graph just to show us in, with this, federal, um, this is uh, you know federal portion of Medicare uh, uh, and Medicaid. Look at these graphs. Look at these incredible slopes and rises in, in healthcare spending over just the last uh, decade. This is also a major problem for disparities. This is an analysis uh, uh, that uh, looks at mortality um, related to um, uh, whether a person is eligible or participating in SNAP. And so black shows uh, all uh, SNAP ineligible individuals, people who have a high enough income that they're not eligible for SNAP or the food stamps program. Blue shows people who are SNAP eligible but not participating. And red shows SNAP participants. And this is adjusted, adjusted for age and, and, and uh, uh, education and race and, and physical activity and many, many other risk factors. And even adjusted for those risk factors, people on SNAP have a twofold higher risk of all cause mortality. And people who are eligible but not participating have a 50% higher risk. Uh, and a lot of this is related to cardiovascular uh, mortality and especially uh, diabetes mortality. Now, you know, what this analysis um, says uh, is that people who are participating in SNAP have much higher mortality. This obviously does not conclude that SNAP is causing mortality. I don't, I don't believe that. What it says is that people who need to be on, on federal food assistance for people who don't have social support and are food insecure, they have much higher risk. And SNAP uh, is not doing enough. I do think it's helping, but it's obviously not doing enough because of these huge disparities. And this has become, you know, much more obvious, I think, to everyone in the, a time of COVID. COVID has shown how uh, fractured and fragmented and uh, broken our food system is, whether it's for immunity, making sure the population has all of the right uh, helpful food and nutrients of optimal immunity, the incredible food insecurity that's arisen from, from lost jobs, the comorbid risk, the diet-related diseases are some of the top risk factors for COVID-19 uh, outcomes, poor outcomes. The, the stress on seniors who already suffer from hidden hunger and, and which may explain some of their higher risk from COVID-19. The disparities among black and brown Americans, the structural racism, a lot of which, not all, but a lot of which is mediated through nutrition. The, the fractured supply chains and food waste that's happened, the, the stress to the jobs and the economy, the confused public about what to do, and the lack really of, of enough science to address all of these things uh, in, a, in a timely and meaningful way. Imagine if when COVID-19 had hit, we had spent years stockpiling sound nutrition science, spending several you know, billion dollars a year to 
to understand everything we needed to know about nutrition and immunity so that when COVID hit, we immediately could say, okay, here's what we need to do in the population. Here's what we need to do from a nutritional standpoint. Here's what we need to do uh, from, let's say, a supplement standpoint to really address COVID. We don't have that science to be able to, to say that in any uh, effective way. And I think one of the most striking things about COVID, which, which is, is a, a, an opportunity and so far a missed opportunity, is to use diet and nutrition to help reduce the severity of, of COVID-19. Um, what's really, you know, both, both uh, frightening and fascinating is that COVID-19 is not just a respiratory disease. It's a respiratory and a vascular and an inflammatory disease. I, I think it really, we should think of this uh, as equally in, involving the lungs, the blood vessels, and, you know, broadly systemic inflammation. This is very different, for example, than, than influenza or many other common respiratory viruses. And, you know, this is a couple of, of uh, interesting papers going through this. this. This summarizes all of the different effects on the endothelial cells and inflammatory pathways. And this is a scanning uh, microscopy of normal uh, uh, capillary beds in the lung, and this is the cap those same capillary beds from a patient infected with COVID-19, lots of direct infection and invasion and destruction of the endothelial cells. This is very, very important to severe outcomes from COVID-19. People with COVID-19, first and foremost, they die because of overwhelming inflammation and clots uh, 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 and endothelial dysfunction in the lung, not because of bacterial superinfection, which, for example, kills most patients with influenza. So, so this is what's causing death, is this severe inflammatory response and endothelial dysfunction in the lung. Secondly, all of the off-target effects, all of the non-pulmonary effects are related to endothelial uh, infection and inflammation, strokes, uh, kidney failure, um, fatigue, myocarditis that's being seen in many, many young people with COVID-19. This long hauler syndrome is all related to this. And why is that important for nutrition? Well, the top risk factors for getting these poor outcomes are diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. What do they have in common? They're all diet-related. They're all diseases of endothelial dysfunction. They're all diseases of systemic inflammation. And so I think that this issue leads me to think about COVID as a fast pandemic on top of a slow pandemic. The fast pandemic is the virus itself sweeping across the world over the last year. But the slow pandemic is the global pandemic of diabetes and obesity just over the last 30 years. And these pandemics are interlinked because if we did not have the pandemic of diabetes and obesity over the last 30 years, COVID-19 would be much, much less severe than it is now. And this is a missed opportunity because at, right away in January and February when we started, uh, you know, putting billions of dollars into vaccines and trillions of dollars into economic recovery, we should have put billions of dollars into research to understand how to address COVID-19 through improving diabetes, obesity, hypertension, endothelial dysfunction, systemic inflammation through food, nutrition, lifestyle, uh, sleep, exercise. This is, it's a huge missed opportunity. Um, now, the public gets this. The public is, is, uh, uh, understands that, that you know, food is making them sick, but they're also incredibly confused. They don't know where to turn. And I think this is because you know, what they're hearing um, is, doesn't match the science, and so there's a lot of confusion. Policy, many of our national and international policies are focused on what I would call the dietary priorities of the, of the last century, reductionist nutritionism um, areas of focus like total fat, saturated fat, cholesterol. Even total calories, I think, is an is a, is a overly reductionist approach. Added sugar is a new, kids on, a new kid on the block in this list. There is some utility to focusing on added sugar, but only some utility. Now, the public has a completely different list. They're focusing on simple silver bullets. Is the food natural? Is it organic? Is it local? Is it low carb? Is it plant-based? Again, the new kid on the block is plant-based. None of those are accurate definitions of, of, a, of a healthy diet. And so I think really the, the, what's driving policy and public choices doesn't match uh, the science. And as one example, right, this is the conventional wisdom, um, which many practitioners, many in the public, much of our policy still follows is that obesity is all about energy in and energy out. We just have to count calories, and if we have to worry about anything, it's just fat or energy density or added sugar. I think this is, this is false and overly simplified and has led to some um, well-meaning uh, policies that have not been helpful. 
Uh, as some examples, you know, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was passed in 2010. It dramatically improved school lunch uh, uh, in many ways. It was very positive. I want to emphasize that. At the same time, one of the things that I don't agree with is that whole milk was banned and chocolate skim milk is allowed in schools. And this is only because chocolate skim milk has slightly fewer calories and less fat than whole milk. And so well-meaning scientists, well-meaning policymakers took a reductionist focus and said, well, if we want to reduce calories and fat, we need chocolate skim milk and not whole milk. There's other examples of this. The new nutrition facts panel, which came out a couple of years ago, dramatically increases the focus on calories. And restaurant menu calorie labeling is now the law of the land in all, all chain restaurants nationally. On the one hand, it's useful to provide calorie information. But on the other hand, you're telling people that they can make a decision based on calories. And I think that's absolutely false. It's always better to eat more calories from healthy food than to eat less calories from unhealthy food, even for risk of obesity. And so calorie counting alone is, is very misleading. Um, this is all, even more true internationally in the United Kingdom. They have a front of pack traffic light label, which is very, very reductionist to focus on calories, total fat, saturated fat, sugars, and salt. And you can see this example of crumpets deliciously fluffy, the UK's number one crumpet, all gets all greens and a little bit of yellow, eat this, even though this is essentially 100% glucose, right? This is, this, this is glucose, uh, glucose bomb, gets all green, uh, you know, uh, lights. And similarly in Mexico and Chile, they've now passed black box warning labels on all foods. There are some strengths to this for additives. So I do think sodium and added sugars are useful things to focus on because you can add them or take them away from an otherwise similar food. But beyond additives, I think focusing on the natural nutrients of a food one at a time is not a helpful way to, to, to drive consumer behavior. Now, why do I say the science has changed? I've mentioned that. I, I said I think you know, a lot of these policies are focused on the priorities of, of the last century. It's because we have a very young science. If we think about modern nutrition science and cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or obesity, um, this graph summarizes the number of scientific publications uh, in every decade since the 1960s. And what you see is we've basically been doubling the science every decade. And so much of what we know uh, has been published in the last 20 years, and that new science has not yet you know, made its way all the way into, uh, into policy and public's knowledge. So I'm going to go over, I think, what some of the top lessons are. And of course, I'm speaking to a functional medicine audience. And so, you know, I think many of you know, know these, these, these lessons and agree with them. But I'm going to give you my perspective of, I think, the top lessons that we've learned. I think, number one, if we want to address obesity, long-term risk of obesity, prevention of obesity, treatment of obesity, we have to move beyond calories. Short-term, you know, count calories, and it works, of course, for a few months. But long-term, you can't judge a food's effects on obesity by its calorie count alone because foods are, uh, uh, as, as Mark has said, food is information. Food is biologic information, which changes the body's responses, changes our, our way our liver, our brain, our gut microbiome, our metabolic expenditure responds. There's many, many uh, trials which, which support this, that we have to move away from calorie counting and towards food quality. Um, and this is just one uh, trial that, that at least in the short term shows this very clearly. This is a, a randomized uh, metabolic uh, uh, trial in a, in a metabolic feeding ward. So everybody got their food for, for two weeks. Then they came back and did the exact same thing on a different diet two weeks later. So this is a crossover trial with the same people. And what they were allowed to do is eat ad libitum two different diets. One was ultra processed foods that were made and packaged by companies. And one was unprocessed foods, which were actually similar foods in many ways, but were, you know, phytochemical rich, naturally, naturally prepared, um, and not, you know, uh, uh, processed and packaged. Now, these diets were matched in terms of fat, carbohydrate, protein, added sugars, dietary fiber, uh, energy density. So they were matched across many of the sort of the reductionist areas of focus. The major difference, again, was ultra-processing versus uh, unprocessed. And what this shows is that without thinking about it, just eating ad libitum, the same people ate, on average, four to 500 calories more per day eating ultra-processed foods. Think about that, four or 500 calories more without even noticing it. And consistent with that, over just two weeks, without thinking about it, without trying, 
People on the ultra processed foods gained a full kilogram in two weeks. And again, without trying to lose weight, when, they, when the same people ate the unprocessed diet, they lost a full kilogram in just two weeks. So this really strongly supports the notion that it's about more than, than just counting calories. It's about the quality of the food, which then drives what we eat and, and how we deal with that food. Lesson number two is we have to move beyond thinking about obesity. Um, I think that one of the major challenges we face today is that diet and obesity are used as interchangeable concepts. If somebody's thin, then their diet must be okay. If somebody's obese, their diet must be poor. Nothing could be further than, than the truth. Obesity is just one pathway uh, whereby diet affects health. And in the 1980s and 90s, we had our blinders on, I think, as, as public health experts focusing on blood lipids, blood cholesterol, and that led to the low-fat diet focus. Now we have our blinders on and we're just thinking about obesity, and that's leading to this calorie fetish and calorie counting focus. We have to move away from single pathways of risk and think about all of the pathways of risk. And of course, this is you know, one of the principles of uh, integrative nutrition or, or functional medicine, thinking about the complexity and moving away from sort of single solutions. Uh, and as just, again, one example is dairy, dairy food. I think, you know, we, uh, I've done a lot of re research thinking about health impacts of, of dairy food on health. And there's incredible complexity here. Um, and we really have to move beyond thinking about dairy in terms of just its fat content or its saturated fat content or its calcium content or its vitamin D content. You know, dairy has so many interesting properties, whether it's fermentation, the type of protein, vitamin K2 or menoquinones, um, uh, effects of, of calcium on GLP-1 signaling, effects of milk fat globule membrane, effects of, of medium chain or odd chain saturated fats, and so on. And so I don't think I can say with definitive knowledge what the effects of milk or yogurt or cheese are on many different health outcomes, although I think the fermentation process and active probiotics in yogurt and cheese are probably beneficial, but I think the complexity is, is really clear. Um, the lesson number three is that this all happens quickly. And again, people in practice have seen this with their own eyes, but I think this is not widely recognized by the public, and it's certainly not widely recognized by policymakers. When I speak to healthcare executives or policymakers about food and nutrition, they often say, yeah, 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 fine, but we need to do something soon. We need to do something right away, right? We can't wait years and years. This doesn't take years and years. What this um, graph summarizes is uh, several uh, randomized control trials, randomized control feeding trials that were six to eight weeks in duration, and they randomized people to different uh, diets without weight loss. So these were calorie matched diets, they maintained weight. And you can see in these different uh, trials that impacts on blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and so on, within just weeks, there are remarkable clinically relevant improvements without any weight loss. I think this is not well understood by most people that within just a few weeks, you can change your diet. So just imagine with COVID-19, every day you have governors and city officials and federal officials talking about mask wearing and social distancing and hand washing. And of course, the response, national response has been uneven, but it's worked. People are following those things on average. Imagine if every day for the last six months, they've been talking about improving your diet quality, moving a little bit more, sleeping a little bit more. Just that few percent change across the population would have had remarkable improvements in our metabolic health. And again, it's a huge missed opportunity. Lesson number four is I think if we want to move away from the reductionist focus and focusing on, you know, single nutrients, we have to focus on foods. Uh, with the exception of additives, as I mentioned, like, like salt or, or uh, artificial additives or added sugars, where we, I think we can keep a little bit of a reductionist focus and focus on those one-on-one, -on -one, one by one, we really have to think about foods. And often when I give this talk um, at the, uh, or give a talk, at the end of my talk, someone comes up and says, yeah, it's just like, you know, I, I, I always say everything in moderation. And I always pause because, you know, my talk is the opposite of everything in moderation. I don't think everything in moderation is the right approach. There are foods that are good for you that we absolutely have to be increasing, not in moderation. We have to be uh, eating more of, of these protective foods. There are foods that are, you know, on average neutral, and neutral is okay. We need to be able to eat foods that are kind of on average neutral for our health for, for a range of, of reasons. And those are the foods we should be eating in moderation. And then there's foods that are actually bad for us, and we shouldn't be eating those in moderation. We should be minimizing those, avoiding those as much as possible. 
Now, the protective foods are at the top based on, you know, what I think the science shows. And what's interesting about these foods um, is most of them are what I call foods that give rise to life. Um, they're foods that if you plant them in the ground um, in the harshest of conditions, they'll nurture a new plant life. And so the thousands of phytochemicals and flavanols that are in these foods that nurture a new plant life under harsh conditions are what I think our body needs uh, to, uh, as we age. And so fruits, nuts, vegetables, the vast majority of, of vegetables are actually fruits, um, whole grains, uh, beans, and plant oils, which are extracts from seeds and nuts and fruits, all of those are foods that give rise to life. Fish uh, have protective omega-3s and yogurt have, uh, you know, probiotics and, and fermentation, and so they're also on that list. Eat in moderation, cheese a little bit higher uh, because of probably the fermentation process uh, and its high menaquinones and, and other aspects seems to maybe protect against diabetes, more research is needed. Poultry, milk, egg, butter, pretty neutral. And I always get asked, what about grass-fed, natural, pasture-raised, you know, organic? Not a lot of evidence yet that, that there's dramatically different health effects. There may be different animal welfare effects. There may be different environmental effects. But in terms of health, there's not a lot of evidence that there's different health effects. Unprocessed red meat's a little bit bad, probably because of the heme iron. Uh, and the worst thing in the food supply is all the refined grain starches and sugars in highly processed and, and packaged foods. Now, there's a lot of emerging science that we don't fully understand. Um, what about effects of different foods on the microbiome, personalized nutrition, all of the thousands of phenolics and bioactives, the impact of different food processing methods, many, many additives, emulsifiers, other things, timing of meals, effects of food on performance, brain health, immunity, allergies, cancer. There's so much we, we need to learn. And so the last lesson, and then I want to get to the food as medicine, is, is how we change behavior. And there's best buy policies, research and innovation, healthcare, economic incentives, schools, works at wellness standards and labeling. And I'm gonna talk about the food as medicine policies. Um, so one of the top policies is medically tailored meals. This is uh, 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 finding chronically ill food insecure patients that have severe diseases that are in and out of the hospital, in and out of emergency room all the time, multiple times per year, conditions like cancer, end stage renal disease, severe heart failure, severe diabetes, HIV, they have huge, huge uh, healthcare utilization. And it's been now shown in many, many pre-post intervention studies that if you actually give people 10, you know, uh, healthy meals per day delivered to their home per week, um, they're actually not only healthier, but you dramatically reduce healthcare utilization. And so this is one analysis showing that giving medically tailored meals reduce hospital admissions by half, reduce nursing facility admissions by three quarters, and actually accounting for the cost of the food saved $9,000 per patient per year. So medically tailored meals are something that every healthcare organization should be piloting, and I hope the Cleveland Clinic uh, should, should pilot as well. Produce prescription programs is the next pillar in food as medicine. It's, it's you know, rather than medically tailored meals where you're treating patients who, who can't really cook or prepare food, this is for people who are sick who have specific diseases, like let's say diabetes as being one of the most obvious ones, or even maybe prediabetes. They can shop, they can cook, but, but they're sick and, and potentially food insecure. There are many interventions that have been done, and this is a, a systematic review that was just recently published on, on this topic. And what this systematic review found is that um, on average, fruit and vegetable uh, provision, even uh, though Again, there's a lot of heterogeneity in, in, in the design. On average, 21 of the 22 studies that assess diet found that they increased food, food quality, fruit and vegetable intake or overall diet quality. Three or four that measured hemoglobin A1C found improvements in A1C, and two of five that measured uh, body weight found improvements in weight or, or BMI. And so this idea of produce RX to um, you know, help health uh, is really important. Now, this is one uh, quasi-experimental uh, example that, that uh, had really remarkable results. This is one of the more, um, um, you know, impressive results, so we can't say this will be generalizable, but Geisinger Health did this for their uh, poorly controlled type 2 diabetes patients who are food insecure. They gave them, uh, you know, fresh, fresh food directly out of the clinic that they could cook at home. It cost them about $2,400 per patient per year, so $200 per month. That's much, much more, for example, than let's say the SNAP benefits, but they gave them healthy foods. And what they found is A1C dropped by two points, two points uh, over 18 months. And you can see all these improvements. These are all improvements in risk factors and their costs dropped by tens of thousands of dollars per patient. So they spent 
2,400 per patient, but they saved money, 80% drop in, in, in net costs for their patients. Now, we've also analyzed this. Um, you know, what if we did this uh, across Medicare and Medicaid? This is a modeling study. This is looking at cost effectiveness. This is cost effectiveness based on uh, dollars per quality adjusted life you're saved. The threshold for an intervention being cost effective is that, you know, you, you gain a quality adjusted life year for less than $150,000 and highly cost effective is less than $50,000 per life year gained. And what we found is these, uh, a produce prescription program in, in our modeling study would be highly cost effective. And at 10 years, giving patients a prescription for fruits and vegetables would be roughly as cost effective as giving a prescription. And come off mute so there's no if, if people who aren't could mute, thank you so much. We also think uh, that we as part of a food as medicine intervention. SNAP is the you know the the, the program formerly known as food stamps, um, probably gonna approach 80 or 90 billion dollars with, with everything that's going on with COVID. And there's been different approaches that have been recommended to subsidize fruits and vegetables for everyone, which is already happening at a small scale, to do that but restrict items like sugar sweetened beverages. And then uh, uh, something that hasn't been widely implemented but we believe is very promising, something we're calling SNAP Plus, which is to incentivize many, many healthy foods, not just fruits and vegetables, but also whole grains and beans and nuts and seeds and legumes and seafood and healthy plant oils and to disincentivize but not restrict unhealthy foods, in particular junk food, processed meats, uh, and sugar sweetened beverages. Now, the advantage, uh, uh, and, and what we modeled what might happen if we implemented these nationally. If we, if we implemented a full fruit and vegetable incentive in SNAP, um, it would prevent 300,000 uh, cardiovascular disease events over the lifetime, but it would cost a lot of money. It would cost $550,000 per quality adjusted life year at five years, which is very expensive. Over a lifetime, it would be cost effective, but it's quite an expensive intervention short term. If you add sugar sweetened beverage restriction, you more than double the cardiovascular benefits. Um, but, and you also, excuse me, uh, you also uh, uh, lower the cost. And so by five years, it's almost cost effective and it's, it's definitely cost effective at a lifetime. But restricting something in SNAP is very uh, controversial. There's a lot of ethical and moral arguments that we shouldn't restrict. Items. And so this idea of incentives and disincentives where a person gets more dollars if they buy healthy foods and slightly less dollars if they buy unhealthy foods, but they still preserve choice, that was actually the most promising um, um, intervention. It would prevent almost a million lifetime events and importantly, it would immediately be cost saving. So the government, the SNAP program would save $10 billion at five years and $60 billion uh, over a lifetime. And so this to me is sort of a no brainer to implement and try to do pilots in many states to see if a SNAP plus intervention uh, will, will be uh, effective and, and, and beneficial. Now, another thing is medical education. I'm sure it's something you guys are thinking about a lot at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, one-off efforts to improve medical education for physicians and other healthcare providers uh, at medical schools and residency programs around the country. I think these one-off efforts are, are not going to succeed because it's too incremental, too small, and too slow. We have to change the system. And so this is a nice report published by colleagues at, at Harvard Law School where they really reviewed, um, you know, all of the different levers to help change medical education and improve nutrition education. And they have four recommended key actions, which I've also spoken about before. The first is to change the accreditation standards to require nutrition education. The second is to tie federal funding to nutrition education. The third is to change the test. If we change the USMLE, the boards, and CME exams for all practicing physicians, you know, so that 5% of questions are on, on nutrition, we'll change education overnight. And lastly, to provide technical assistance, the CDC could provide this, for example, to, to make this possible. Um, now, you know, when I talk about these things, some of you may think, well, all of these are good ideas, but it's never gonna happen. Uh, but I, I, one of my, Key messages is that this is actually starting to happen and accelerating, and and everyone, all of us, can can further accelerate this. So in 2016, John Hancock became the first major life insurance program in the country to actually reward clients for buying healthy food to pay them to incentivize them. A produce RX program essentially get pay them up to $600 per year to buy healthy food. 
The Farm Bill uh, recently put $25 million to test British prescription in healthcare. The state of California has a $6 million pilot they're implementing. Kaiser Permanente has announced Food for Life, which is a, a major new focus on nutrition security, including medically tailored meals. Massachusetts right now is in the middle, uh, at, the, at the start, of a $150 million program that, that is funding uh, uh, ACOs to, to provide food. We're uh, speaking to four of these major ACOs to evaluate their medically tailored meal programs. And there's a bill not yet passed. There's a bipartisan bill that was introduced just a few months ago to direct uh, the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services to test medically tailored meals uh, in Medicare, which I think is a very important bill. So, so this is actually happening in real time. It's also happening in real time for business. Um, businesses are thinking about this. And I think the two canaries in the coal mine, you know, two examples are Kraft Heinz and Beyond Meat. Kraft Heinz decided after a, a, a leveraged buyout uh, by a company named 3G in 2017 that they were gonna stop innovating. They were just gonna focus on, on making a profit with their existing products. And they have had one of the worst corporate performances over the last three years uh, with this lack of focus on innovation. Beyond Meat, in contrast, the plant-based burger um, is innovating for the environment. I don't think there's any evidence that this is better for health, but, but, but we need to, to test that, but it is definitely better for the environment. And that innovation has led to an $8.5 billion market cap. So there's money to be made uh, for innovating uh, here. And we are working with businesses, advocacy organizations to help spur this forward. We uh, have more than 50 organizations in, in the Tufts Food and Nutrition Innovation Council trying to spur this investment and in innovation towards health, equity, and sustainability. And so if you're interested in learning more, please go to our website and you can learn about that. And to really get all of this to work, we need much more investment in nutrition science. I, I talked about at the beginning, imagine having stockpiled science on nutrition and immunity over the last 10 years so that when COVID-19 hit, we were immediately ready to, to uh, implement and use that stockpile of science for, for, for good. We don't have that science. We, there are so many questions that are unanswered and we need much more science. And so we've uh, worked over the last year, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, to review all of the current efforts and all of the past efforts over the last 50 years around uh, federal nutrition research. And then to give clear, objective, recommended actions to accelerate national nutrition research. And so we gave our recommendations. We, we presented this at the Bipartisan Policy Center in DC over the summer. Uh, I encourage you to, to, to look at the paper if you're interested, but we have three broad recommendations. We wanna strengthen cross-governmental coordination uh, the, the governmental approach, the federal approach to food and nutrition is, is highly fragmented. We want to strengthen research and coordination within NIH, and we want to strengthen research and coordination within USDA. Among the specific recommendations, you know, two of the top recommendations are, are these. First, for coordination, to create a new office of the National Director of Food and Nutrition. This is modeled after the very successful office of the Director of National Intelligence. That office, the ODNI, was created after September 11th when it was recognized that we had fragmented national intelligence efforts across the CIA, the FBI, the National Security Council, the, the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. And so all of those efforts were brought together and coordinated under the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. It's been highly effective. It informs the White House, the agencies, uh, uh, and has been extremely successful. So, so we have many times more investment uh, in food and nutrition federally than we do in national intelligence. The, the, the spending on food and nutrition is many fold higher than national intelligence, and yet it's similarly fragmented. And so we believe that the next administration and, and Congress should create an office of the National Director of Food and Nutrition modeled on the ODNI, uh, which would really help coordinate all of the federal uh, issues around food and nutrition. And within NIH, Darius, we seem to have lost your audio. I hope folks can hear me. My phone dropped out. Let me, uh, let me, okay, you can. So, um, uh, so sorry, my phone just, just died in the middle, but um, let me go back to the share here. 
Uh, and within NIH, we uh, uh, you know recommend a National Institute of Nutrition. There's 27 centers and institutes at NIH. The NIH is, is, is an amazing organization that's promoting science and fundamental discovery. Great nutrition science already happens at NIH, but it's too little and it's, it's not coordinated. And so we want this to be additive. We want additional funding that Congress should add a billion or $2 billion a year to the NIH budget and create a new National Institute of Nutrition. That wouldn't take away from you know, any of the, of the amazing science already going on, but would be additive. And you know, a billion or two billion a year for a new National Institute of Nutrition sounds like a lot, but it's a drop in the bucket. You know, the, the federal government spends 160 billion a year just on direct medical care for type two diabetes alone. And so, compared to what we're spending on um, uh, food and nutrition programs, compared to what we're spending on healthcare, adding a billion or two dollars at the NIH to study nutrition science would have rapid, rapid positive returns on investment for our country. And What's exciting about this, again, is it's not a pie-in-the-sky idea that it's never going to happen. There's many, many organizations which are firmly in support of this, and so we've built a coalition. We've built a coalition of diverse businesses and advocacy groups that are in support of this. We actually love to add the entire Cleveland Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic Inc., to really you know, show support if they're interested. We have major organizations who have joined on, businesses, nonprofit organizations, groups like the NAACP, the American Society for Nutrition, the American Diabetes Association, food companies, pharma companies, investment firms, and this coalition over the next year, we're going to be working with this coalition to talk about these issues, bring these issues to Congress, help educate congressional leaders about these issues and why we need strong, a stronger approach to nutrition uh, in our country. Um, so at the end of the day, we have incredible national nutrition challenges, chronic diseases, food insecurity, health disparities, public confusion, spiraling healthcare costs, spiraling government budgets, you know, uh, drains on our economic competitiveness, threats to military readiness, and major you know, threats to sustainability. All of these are challenges and all of these can actually be addressed. And so I'm optimistic that we can actually try to tie these together and, and have uh, you know, our, our country and our leaders and, and globally have people start to address this. Um, so, you know, this is kind of a summary of what I think are some of the top priorities. There's many things that should be done, but the top priorities are food as medicine, implement medically tailored meals, produce prescription programs, nutrition education, and something I didn't talk about, uh, implement food quality and, and uh, nutrition security into the electronic health record. We need to, to work on economic incentives, have health insurance, life insurance, worksite wellness, support healthier eating, leverage SNAP, as I mentioned, and tax foods that are clearly unhealthy so we have revenue to do some of these other, other programs. We need to push science, innovation, and entrepreneurship. We need a National Institute of Nutrition. We need a new Office of the National Director of Food and Nutrition. We need to reward business innovation. I mentioned that briefly, but it's very important. We need to create ESG metrics for investors, create new tax policy, investor vehicle, opportunity zones, B corporations that reward business innovation. All of this will revitalize farming in rural America, create new jobs and businesses. We have to have that message if, the, if this is going to work. And I think the U.S. can, can create a 21st century ecosystem for healthy, equitable, and sustainable food, making it the breadbasket for the world for, for you know, what the food, food system should, should look like. And if we want to do this together, you know, one idea is to bring together all the stakeholders in, in 2021 in the new administration and, and try to organize and have a White House conference on these issues, bring together all the stakeholders and create real action. The first and only White House conference on food, nutrition, and health was in 1969. It was organized by Dr. Jean Mayer, who's the founder of our school, and, and I'm the Jean Mayer professor, so it's a big, a big responsibility to shoulder. Um, he, in 1969, created a White House conference with President Nixon that was focused exclusively on caloric hunger. 1,800 recommendations came out of that conference. 1,650 of them were passed. The major ones, expansion of school lunch, expansion of SNAP, creation of school breakfast, creation of WIC, creation of the nutrition tax panel. So much of our current food policy is based on this 1969 conference. I think that it's time in 2021 to have the second White House conference on food, nutrition, and health. So much has changed. Uh, in 50 years, uh, and, and I think it's time. Now, uh, I, I'm done with my, 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 my talk. I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know if my um, audio works here, so I may have to call back in, but uh, Mark, if you could unmute and, and speak, I'll, 
I'll see if I can hear you. If not, it'll just be a delay while I call back in. Well, thank you so much, Charles. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Okay, great. Well, I, I'm just by your talk. It just speaks to so many issues that we're facing today as a society. And I think the audio is pretty good. Becky, I don't know if you hear it that way. Do you? No, for me. Okay. Um, so I think I think we're just at this pre precipice of real change. And I believe that, that your talk really laid out in a coherent fashion the things we really need to focus on. Uh, I'm going to invite questions in the chat, and I think we're going to try to bring some questions. But I, I do have a question, and I, and I was recently reviewing the Endocrine Society uh, position papers on obesity and the pathogenesis of obesity. Uh, and it was so clear in there that they are still focused on the energy balance, calorie in, calorie out hypothesis. And these are leading scientists in the obesity field, many of which you know and work with. Um, and the paradigm seems so locked in and it seems so difficult to change because the whole idea of food as medicine means that different calories have different medicinal properties and that should be taken into account. And yet, when you're looking at the advice given to um, the government by people who are on the dietary guidelines panel and others, it's, it's very much in the old paradigm. So how do we break through that idea of calories a calorie to food as information and food as medicine? Well, you know, I have no magic answers to my own, you know, only my my experience, and I think that um, it's it's um, new science and and persistence and um, coordination uh, until you know the, the the new evidence is is recognized and and you know becomes the norm. This happened with total fat, right? When I was uh, the reason I became interested in nutrition was in medical school in in the '90s and in residency in the late '90s. Um, I wasn't getting any nutrition education myself, so I went to read about it myself. I said, how shocking, the number one <laughs> issue facing my patients for health I'm not learning about. And so when I read the papers then, this was in the 90s, in the midst of the low-fat diet you know, fetish, right? A patient would get admitted to the hospital, I'd write cardiac diet, right? You know what, you know, you know what that is, low-fat, low saturated low fat, low-cholesterol. And uh, – uh, it's still in many hospitals that that's what it is. And I, when I read the science myself, 25 years ago, the science didn't support a low-fat diet. 25 years ago, the science didn't support a low-fat diet. The Women's Health Initiative was a you know nearly 50,000-person randomized controlled trial testing a low-fat diet. Mm. No impact on heart disease. No impact on stroke. No impact on diabetes. No impact on insulin resistance. No impact on cancer. It was published in 2006, right? And yet it took until 2015 for the dietary guidelines very quietly to drop their focus on total fat. Uh, and the DRIs for total fat haven't been updated since 2002, and there's still a 35% limit on total fat. So my point is that here we are 25 years later after the science didn't support a low-fat diet, and we're still moving away from that. But we are moving away from that. And so as, as I mentioned the 2015 dietary guidelines very quietly said there's no longer any reason to limit total fat. It was one sentence, but it was what was in there. Um, you know, but still, many people are confused about that. So I think that this. But but they still on there go slow, go slow foods. They still recommend low fat foods and low fat dairy. It's just, it's not yeah. all in sync. In terms it, of it's, it's, it's 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 shifting. It's different than it was. So. So that's the one example. So I think we're in the same place for, for obesity and calories. It's going to maybe take 20 years to, to get away from this. And, and that's just that's just too long. So I think that, you know, a National Institute of Nutrition is really important to accelerate the research so we can really do more studies and, 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 and test this. But a lot of the science is already there. I mean, I've already highlighted some of these studies. I think Kevin Hall's study um, is pretty meaningful because Kevin Hall was dramatically in the cal all calories are the same group. And, and I think he, he has concluded that that's not, not true. Um, uh, and so I think that's a, a big advance. Uh, so, you know, I don't know, Mark, I think we need more of these conferences, more convenings, more funding. Um, and, and it's just going to take time. Uh, I have a great question from Dr. Bradley, who's our medical director. And she's talked about Kevin Hall's research that you just mentioned with unprocessed food and energy intake. And and the, the question is really is is what is the um, reason? What are the components in the ultra processed food that drive the overeating and the weight gain? Is that is there is there data on that? Is there understanding of that mechanism? 
Yeah, it's it's all speculative right now. It's all speculative, right? Based on sort of mechanism, some mechanistic insights and sort of first principles and other studies. Um, and this is really, really, really important to figure out. Um, you know, Carlos Montero in, in Brazil, who's, who's one of the, you know, lead people who sort of popularized this notion and came up with the NOVA classification. Um, I've talked to him many times. He had a, a you know, doctoral student visit with us for a year and, and we helped kind of actually update and edit the NOVA classification a little bit. We've talked many times. He has trouble pinpointing exactly the, the mechanism, you know, when, when I speak to him and he says, maybe it's the, 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 you know, the serving size, maybe it's how it's eaten, you know, in addition to all these other things, you know, maybe there's lots of, 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 of um, you know, unconscious ways about marketing and other things. Of course, there's other biologic things about carb processing and sodium and taste and other things, but it has to be more than that. But I, but I think it's not established, Mark. I think my, mm -hmm. my bottom line message is not established and we have to figure it out because we have to have processed foods, right? This idea that mm. we're going to move to minimally processed, homegrown foods anytime in the in the coming, you know, recent recent coming years is not true for the vast majority of the globe. We're going to have to have processed and packaged foods that are safe, inexpensive, convenient, shelf stable, and are healthy. And so it means mm. we have to figure out optimal processing. And so I think that. <laughs> You know, to figure out what optimal processing is, we have to figure out what's bad, figure out what's bad and stop doing it. And and so I'll tell you my theories. I don't have definitive evidence. My theories are, number one, it's related to fast carbs. And so I think mm. taking, you know, um, uh, starch and sugar out of its natural food structure leads to all kinds of problems It it, you know, overwhelms your, your bloodstream with those nutrients and it starves your microbiome at the same time. So it's a double hit. I think that that's a big thing. I think a second big, big thing is stripping away of phenolics and phytochemicals and, and other naturally present compounds. I think that's crucially important. I think the third big thing is additives and which, which ones, I don't know. And so I used to poo poo um, concerns about emulsifiers and stabilizers and all the stuff that's in all our food. And then I started reading just there's a handful, a handful of animal experiments suggesting that maybe they have some harms for the gut and for the microbiome. Mm -hmm. Almost no human studies. Right. And so we have yeah. additives in our food supply that could be safe. I'm not saying they're dangerous. They could be safe, but they could be toxic and, mm -hmm. and toxic subtly. Right. Not not. And they haven't been adequately studied. So. So I guess that's a long way of saying I think that we have ideas about why ultra processed foods are bad. Um, and. I think we have ideas about which processed foods could be better or worse for you, um, but we don't have all the answers. Well, leaning on that, one of the key things that you emphasize is this idea of protective foods. And you're working with the Rockefeller Foundation to create the periodic table of phytochemicals, essentially the 25,000 or who knows how many phytochemicals there are in foods that are medicinal and how we can begin to increase and use those within our food production system and as uh, added quote additives or things that would actually enhance the food supply and protect against disease. Can you talk about that project, what you're finding and how uh, some of these phytochemicals do work as protective foods? Yeah, well, so I think outside of kind of the classical, you know, vitamins and defic vitamin deficiency diseases that we discovered in kind of the 20s and 30s um, and amino acid functions and, uh, you know, um, and some, you know, particular redox equations that need a vitamin. I think most of what's nutritional about food is going to be prebiotics, probiotics, and phenolics. That's the, and phytochemicals. Mm -hmm. That's probably what mostly affects our health, um, together with then the harmful harms of of of, of additives and processing, um, for example, on glucose, you know, um, uh, glycemia. So so we need to understand these thousands and thousands of phytochemicals. I think they're crucial for our health and for the health of a microbiome. And so the Rockefeller Foundation has this vision that we can get maybe the thousand most commonly consumed foods and measure them using mass spec, spec around the world in every possible iteration, where they're grown, you know, what season they were grown and how they're prepared. So we understand and catalog in a publicly available database of these thousands of phytochemicals. They, this process, mm -hmm. this project will take several years, obviously. Um, they anticipate that it could take up to $300 million of funding over five years. They've committed some of that and are looking for co-funding, you know, that's a big amount, right, for them to, 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 to do to have all of this work be done. But they think that, you know, if we invest 50 million a year for the next several years, we could answer this question. 
And, and, you know, again, it sounds like a lot of money, $300 million, but it's nothing. It's nothing. Right? <laughs> if they had a National Institute of Nutrition, they could say, yeah, let's do a $30 million project. It's a good idea. And they could get this done. So, so it's, again, why we need federal investment in this area. The Rockefeller Foundation is, is being an incredible leader, but um, they need help. They need help with, with support. So, so the project is just starting. Um, you know, uh, I've just been advising them, you know, uh, uh, on the project. They've put out calls now for the secretariat and, and organizational structures to kind of start the project. And it's at the, at its earliest stages. That's great. Well, it's exciting because I think we focus so much on what's bad and not on what's good. And, and the idea of food as medicine is such a, a new framework for actually thinking about food. And, and, and there's a question I, I'll come to in a minute, but I, I wanted to ask you in the, in the context of, of food as medicine, clinical trials, you know, What's being done out there? Because it seems like we are understanding the, the components of ways in which food may interact with us. But to take, say, let's say, let's say, let's do a clinical trial on food as medicine for autoimmune disease or diabetes or any number of, of conditions. Are those being done? Why, if so, uh, who's doing them? And if not, why not? <laughs> yeah. Well, so first, just just language, I think, is important. So, so you know, um, I've used the term food as medicine in different ways. And, and so uh, I think it's a good term, but we should, you know, it's, it's considered in different ways. So, you know, one could think of food as medicine as, as kind of the medical foods, right? You want to give Ensure or TPN, right? That, Ooh, that's no. food as medicine for, for, for some people, right? You could think of food as medicine uh, as, um, you know, treatment, disease treatment, disease modification, right? Um, and so I, I think that's, that's you know a second uh, approach, and then the third, more narrow um, definition would be sort of what I was focused on the talk is food as medicine as integrating healthcare to pay for food, you know through produce prescriptions or, or medically tailored meals or other things. I think all of those are different ways of looking at food as medicine. So my talk was again focused on that on that third category, but I think the second category in that in that third category. Um, I know of two ongoing medically tailored meal trials, um, testing if medically tailored meals actually help patient outcomes. So one is, I think, completed by UCSF looking at heart failure. Uh, and one is just started, led by at Tufts, led at, by our school, focusing on lung cancer. So randomized control trial of whether giving medically tailored meals will help lung cancer outcomes. Um, uh, so uh, produce prescription programs, there's, there's going to be small, mostly pre-post studies being done. There's no large randomized control trials that I know of yet of produce prescription programs. Um, uh, in terms of foods for disease treatment, you know, this is a challenge of our, our regulatory system, right? The FDA um, doesn't, you know, allow and consider um, food as a drug. Uh, and, and so disease treatment is kind of off, off limits for regulatory purposes and health claims. Um, and at the same time, the dietary guidelines for Americans explicitly are for healthy people, not for any dietary intervention to, to address a disease. So if you have hypertension, if you want to lose weight, if you have diabetes, if you have prediabetes, if you have gut symptoms, if you have heartburn, if you have what 90% of, 95% of Americans have, the dietary guidelines don't apply to, to you for treatment of those disease conditions. So we yeah. have a, a, an unfortunate regulatory disconnect, Mark, where if somebody wanted to do a study of food for treatment of disease, who's going to fund it, right? Mm -hmm. The food company doesn't want to fund it because they can't patent it. They can't go to FDA. They can't, they can't do it. So you need public funding. And so, again, it, there's some, some stuff that's been done, of course, but very, very little. So, so I think that it, it's we, we have to accelerate the funding to get some of these studies to, to be done to really understand. And you know, we need we need to do hundreds of studies, right, to mm. answer some of these questions. Well, thank you so much, Dari, for your talk and uh, for your time. Uh, you know what you've laid out is really a, a vision for a future of a better food system, healthier population, and uh, pandemic resilience, which all is what we need right now. So thank you for your pioneering work and your vision and leadership in this field. And uh, I'm honored to call you a friend. And so thankful that you came and joined us today at the Center for Functional Medicine's uh, Grand Rounds. These Grand Rounds will be available online on our site, uh, Center for Functional Medicine. Afterwards, you'll be able to listen to the whole thing, including the Q&A, uh, and share it with everybody, because I think the whole world needs to hear this talk. So, so great. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for joining, everybody. We'll see you next time at our next Grand Rounds. Okay.